time. Turn your head and say, it's good to see you. It's good to see you guys, too. Um, today, um, I'm going to be talking out of uh, the Gospel of John. So, the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And I'm going to be um, in chapter 1 at verse 35. So, um, I get the sense that this is super timely. Without divulging too much, uh, I just I know for sure that it is. I know that a lot of people are going through um, similar things to what to what I'm going through, to what my wife is going through. I just I get that sense. I mean, God's just like prepared a word for you today. Everybody say it's my word. It, say it like you mean it. It's my word. That's better. You guys like by the fifth or sixth time, we'll get it. You just say it good the first time, and we won't have to redo. Um, but I want to talk to you out of this today because I feel like um, everybody who's familiar with this is like, oh, that's why he wore the shirt. Yeah, that's why I wore the shirt. It's, I feel like we need to kind of come and see today. Like a lot of us, do, we just do. We need, to, we need to come and see. So um, starting at verse 35, this is after... John the Baptist has basically said, hey, like, I know that I'm doing a, a cool thing here and baptizing people and doing a good job, and that, but, he, but he's, that guy right there, Jesus, he's the one that you need to be following. He actually said, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. Like, you guys think I'm so good and so spiritual and so cool, but I'm nothing, I'm literally nothing compared to him. You need to follow him. So right after he says that, Right after he says, um, if you look up, if you're using an NLT, up one verse, it says, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, John said, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. So in verse 35, that's where we'll pick up. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? You know, you, the word standing, I don't know, this is like a new thing for me. This is like a newer thing for me to be like always looking at the Greek words every time I come up here. But the word standing there doesn't just mean like on accident. It doesn't mean that like, you know, Randy's looking at the, you know, just for men hair care selection at Walmart and I run into him. Like, oh, there's Randy standing there. Right? It's not, it's not like that. Sorry, Randy. It's not like that. It's not like, oh, I just, he happened to be standing there. This word standing actually means placed. Like, like, they were standing there, but on purpose, like with a purpose. So I believe one of the words for a lot of you today is that you've been placed here. You're, you're standing here, you're sitting here. You're here for a reason. It's not on accident. They weren't accidentally there. They didn't happen to bump into Jesus. They were placed there. They were standing there. Um, the, the same word is used when the, when Jesus tells the disciples, Hey, if you're not, if you don't become like, uh, like as into one of these talking about a little child, when, when Jesus says that he, he, the Bible says he placed the child in the middle of them. That's the same. It's the same word. So they were, they were placed there on purpose. And I believe that you are placed here on purpose today. Everybody say it's my word. Everybody say it's my word. That's, that's better. That's good. We'll get there. We'll get there. Jesus looked around back in verse 38 and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come and see. Come and see, he said. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. You know, a lot of the time, we pray prayers or we ask God questions, 
Um, we want to know something about how our future is going to go, about what's the next thing. And a lot of, almost always, God doesn't set out the plan by like step by step. He doesn't give you 36 steps to success. Does that make sense? Like God wrote a book, it's this one, but he didn't write like a self-help book or like 12, 12 keys to success or here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four. He doesn't really work like that because God doesn't, if that, were, if that were the way God worked, you would follow a formula instead of him. Does that make sense? It's my kid. Poor baby. Um, but if, you, if, if, if God were to give you 12 steps to success, that's what you would follow instead of him. Because that's what we want. I, want, I, I don't know if you're a list person. I'm a list person. I love lists. Step one. Do this. Pray every day for 12 minutes. Okay, if I know that I'm going to succeed, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray every day, first thing, for 12 minutes. That's what I'm going to do. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Step four, do that. That's what I, and then I would, okay, I'm going to follow the formula because that's how I'm going to be blessed by God. I'm going to follow the formula and kind of leave God in the dust. Does that make sense? So instead of saying, oh, well, I'm staying over here, and this is what I'm going to do next, and my ministry is going to last three years, and, 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 he says, just come and see. Come see. Come look for yourself. Come find out. And that's what God says to us a lot of times when we're wanting the answers. He doesn't say, well, here's step one. Here's step two. This is what's going to happen when you're 34 years old. This is what's going to happen when you're 39 years old. This is what's going to happen when you're, he says, come and see. Let's do life together. Because he doesn't want you to follow a list of rules. He wants a relationship with you. Because he doesn't want you to love a list more than you love him. Because he loves you way more than any list can provide. Come and see. God often. Everybody say, almost always. Almost always answers in a, in a way like that. You know it's God speaking, but he doesn't give you the list. He says, come and see. Come and see, he said. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, verse 40, was one of these men who had heard that John who had heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to his brother Simon and told him, "We have found the Messiah, which means Christ." It's something that you can kind of like read by really quickly and be like, "Oh, that's what happened. Like that's the next thing that happened." I think what's important here, what's something that we need to realize is the timeline. How long, were, how long were they with Jesus? One afternoon. One afternoon. They were following someone else, right? They were doing life one way. And all it took was one afternoon. We'll call it six hours with Jesus. And he's like, Simon, you gotta, you're never going to believe this. We found the Messiah. We've been waiting for him all this time. It took six hours, maybe eight, for him to know, to know that he knows that he knows. Like I know and you know that we know that we found Jesus. It only took a little bit. That's why I believe that you're placed here today. Because God is here. Jesus is here. And you can be convinced of that in just a couple hours. We're getting to the good part. Everybody say the good part. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who had heard what John had said and then followed Jesus one afternoon. Andrew went to his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Everybody say Simon. Looking intently. The Greek word there is in blepo. It's not like looking. It's not like me looking at, not like me looking at you. It's uh, a better word picture would be like, like that I, to know you. 
Like to discern the the real the, the the real description would be to discern clearly. It's not like oh I I see you standing there. It's like I see every part of you right in front of me. Like I know you well. Looking intently at Simon. Jesus said, your name is Simon. Everybody say Simon. Son of John. But you will be called Cephas, which I believe actually is Cephas, right, Pastor? Hopefully. I think it's with a K sound. But we say Cephas because that's, that's how we were brought up, which means Peter. So this is kind of interesting. Cephas, because I'm not a scholar. I'm right there with you. Cephas which is translated Peter for us, the name means um, rock. Eventually Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. It's, it's interesting, the rock, the R in this word rock is capitalized. So literally, Jesus renames Simon the rock, like Dwayne Johnson. He's like, you're the rock. He's the OG, he's the real rock. He's the real the rock. There's a lot of words for rock. Instead of Cephas, um, it could have been another word for rock that is, uh, means like rock, like a, like a hollow rock, a rock that's a hiding place, like a cleft in the mountain. It could have been um, lithos, which is like stone. Like if we're going to build a building out of stones, that would be like a small stone, like a building block size rock. Uh, and Cephas it means the rock, but like a bigger rock. And I think it's Jesus looks intently at Simon. He looks at him and knows him, like really knows him. Not kind of knows him, not like, oh, hey, Simon, I've heard a lot about you. Like one of my talent scouts, Gabriel, was out the other day, and he saw that you were like really, I mean, man, you got an arm, dude. Like I want you on my team. It's not like I know some things about you. He's like, I, I know who you are. I know you. I know everything about you. And what's interesting, so every time you see Simon Peter through the rest of the Gospels, depending on which translation you have, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about this Simon that got renamed Peter. Okay? So, Jesus sees him clearly. It says he looks at him intently in the version that I'm using. But he, he sees him. He discerns clearly who he is. And that matters because a lot of... I'm a Simon. I'm a Simon. I was a Simon. We're all Simons. And Jesus looks at us and he says, Simon might be your name. Which means God has heard. But Peter's who you are. I know you. I know you well. I see you intently. I, I, he discerns clearly who we are. Jesus sees clearly Peter when everyone else sees Simon. Everyone else knows him as Simon. He's been Simon his whole life. And just like it took one afternoon to convince the first two that he is who he says he is. It takes just one instant of time. And Simon is now Peter. He changed who he is. We'll get to that in a minute. Back at verse 43. Everybody say, this is my word. Everybody say, this is my word. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Lord, help me. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. 
Philip was, was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Raise your hand if Jesus came looking for you and found you. He did, right? A lot of us. Jesus goes out specifically with the intent to find Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. Again, it's the, it's not, Jesus is the God of the universe. He didn't do this on accident. It was like, eh, I feel like going to, you know, let's go somewhere else today. Oh, look at that. He looks like he'll work. He'd be a great guard to go with a guy that's got the arm. He'll fit on the team nicely. No, he went there on purpose. So he goes, and he finds Philip and says to him, come follow me. In the next verse, this is the part that I really kind of want to focus on. Philip went to look for Nathanael. Now Jesus went somewhere with the intent to find Philip. Philip goes somewhere with the intent to find Nathaniel. Raise your hand if uh, maybe somebody who knew Jesus found you. For sure me. This is definitely the camp that I fit into. Like I didn't, I didn't have, like I didn't, I didn't meet God directly on my own, if that makes sense. I had somebody who knew God that came to me first. Right? Jesus met Gary, and Gary came and found Paul. Gary came looking for Paul. Philip goes looking for Nathaniel. And he tells him the same thing that everybody else has been saying. We have found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? Everybody say Nazareth like that. Everybody say Nazareth like it's somewhere you don't want to go. Nazareth? Nazareth? Can any good? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth had a absolute max, historically they believe, population of 480 people. Most believe that it was like 120, 150, so like maybe 10 families. So he's like, what? Nazareth isn't important at all. What are you talking about? Like, I'm pretty sure they just started using tools there. Like, what do you, what do you mean he's from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself. You might have been found by someone who has been found by Jesus. The way that I was. Someone came looking for me that already knew who Jesus was. And I think it's, we're human. Everybody say, I'm human. We're human. So we think things like, well, there's only like, Randy, did you count how many people are here? Okay, all right. Okay. So, there's only 47 people in this room on a Sunday morning. Can anything good come from a group where there's only 47 people on a Sunday morning? I should get to the place where there's 1,000 people on Sunday morning, 20,000 people watching online on a Sunday morning. Can anything good come from a church in Coon Rapids? We're human. We think not on purpose, but we, Nathaniel's being very like all of us. He's like, what? That backwater dump? Nazareth isn't just Nazareth when God is there. In Spirit of Grace Church, a 200-person or whatever it is, 300-person sanctuary is not just a church when God is here. Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's just a 200-person church, not when God is here. So, A long time ago when I was like, I 
I think we stopped going to this church when I was like 12. There's a little tiny church in Hastings, Minnesota called the Life Tabernacle. That's the church that I grew up in until I was like, I don't know, 12 to 14. My memory is not super great. But I had, there was the pastor there, um, Brother Lehman, Pastor Lehman, always said that a man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. A man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And so <laughs> what, what Philip says is, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Like, I know. I've met him. I know that he's the Messiah. Come and see. Come and see. He's kind of like, um, if only it were true, but I picture it. Raise your hand if you remember the movie The Matrix. Come on, people who grew up in the 2000s for sure. Let's go. So he's like, when Morpheus is like fighting him, and he goes like, like that's what I picture. He's like, come and see. Come get some, bro. Come and see. Because when you know, you know. There is no doubt. I can't be like, oh, I... I was probably just emotional. I'm not emotional at all. Like, those of you who know me know that. I'm not a super emotional guy. The only person who knows that I have emotions is Katie, and that's because we've been married for 12 years. We're just starting to, I'm just starting to break through, guys. I'm getting close. <laughs> when you know, you know. When you've met the man, you know. When you've met Jesus, you know. If you've only heard about Jesus, it's really hard to believe that he is who he says he is. When you've met him, when you've spent an afternoon with him. I feel like I talk about Zacchaeus every time I'm up here. All it took was one dinner at, at Zacchaeus' house, and he's like, I'm giving everything away. I don't want any part of being a liar or a, or a robber. I don't want to steal people's money anymore. I don't care how rich it made me. I'm done. I'm giving it all back. Four times as much as I rob people, I'm giving it back. It doesn't take very long in the presence of the real Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one. It took one afternoon, one dinner. It doesn't take very long. You're here for two and a half hours. It doesn't take very long. Come and see for yourself. Right? Philip replied, as they approached, Jesus said. Everybody say, Jesus said. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. He was smiling at me a minute ago. A man of complete integrity. You know, we, because we're human, everybody say, I'm human. Because we're human, we tend, to, we tend to think of Jesus, who is God, as being just like us. Um, we're made in his image, but he's not just like us. Because what is the number one thing that you or I remember about someone else? Their good qualities or their bad qualities? What do you talk about when somebody's not around? You're not like, oh, man, Travis is so nice. He's so handsome, and, man, I just wish I could be more like him. Right? That's not what people, I mean, that's what I say about you, but that's not what, that's not what people say behind other people's backs. They talk about the negative. Oh, did you hear, like, what so-and-so did to so-and-so? I heard this. Or you, you, you hear somebody's name mentioned, and you go, oh, that guy was really bad to me. But I don't even talk to that guy anymore. Right? Or they, the first thing that we think of is the negative. Right? Right? I'm sensing a lot of judgment here, church. Come on. That's, we, we do that, right? Because we're humans. We remember the bad things. That's why in customer service they say it takes 10 good reviews for every one bad review to, like, even the tide. Because one person who has a negative experience will talk to 10 people about it. And most people who have a good experience will talk to one person. That's just the math. That's the, I mean, that's the way that it is. 
That's the way we are. That's the way people are. We remember the bad things. And Jesus is not like you. He's not like me. Because Jesus being God, how much does he know about Nathaniel? Everything. Every single thing that he's ever done. He knows how many hairs are on his head. The Bible says he counts the hairs on your head. He knows. He knows everything about you. Every single thing. Every time you've sworn, but only in your head, right? <laughs> he knows it. He knows it all. You can't hide anything from him. He's the God of the universe. He knows everything. There's nothing that can hide from him. And Jesus being God, fully God, fully man, right? Amen? 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 Come on. I did music practice. you got to get with me here. Let's go. So Jesus being fully God says, Here's a, he's a, he is the real deal. This guy right here is a genuine son of Israel, a complete, totally a man of complete integrity. Is it possible that he was? I doubt it. Highly doubt it. Of complete integrity. All the time, his whole life, he never messed up? Never lied once? Pretty tough. But Jesus doesn't say, here's a man who really struggles with addiction. Hey, everybody, here's the guy that, that really deals with lust in his heart all the time. Here's a guy who can't get his act together, whose heart is full of hate. He can't forgive his dad. He doesn't say that. He says, here is a, man, a true son of Israel, a man of complete integrity, because Jesus focuses on the good that's in you. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. But we think that God is like always just waiting for a chance to beat us up. Oh, you messed up again today. I'm going to just like withdraw this blessing. Oh, that spiritual gift is going to be gone now because you didn't meet the mark today. We just lie and wait. We, we, it's like, <laughs> like we as, raise your hand if you're a list lover. Come on, raise your hand if you love lists. It's church. God knows if you do or don't. Or real high, like you mean it. If you're a list lover, a lover of lists of things to do, to-do lists, if you love steps, then you, like me, struggle with this mentality. You think God is keeping a list of all the things that you do wrong. Not good enough. Nope, that was one too many. Shouldn't have done that. Had another impure thought. Now I can't use you anymore. Jesus calls out Nathaniel's best quality, even though he knows everything. Absolutely everything that Nathaniel's done. And there's no way that he hasn't screwed up. It's not possible. I don't think you can go through life without screwing up. Because if you could, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. And God seemed to think that that was necessary. Right? We can't meet the mark. But Jesus says, this is my guy right here. I want you to know that God's not, it's not that he doesn't know. That you've done right and done wrong and screwed up a lot and probably... You know, like you're kind of in the middle, but you focus on the bad because you're a human being like me, like all of us, where it's like, oh, I'm not good enough anymore. Whoops, screwed up again. God's not keeping a list like that. He's focusing on the good. He's cor he'll correct you when you do wrong, right? The, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is a teacher. He will guide you away from the things that you should not be doing. But he's not, he's not like just waiting to crush you. God is not waiting to tell you that you're not good enough because you've been placed here. So I know that that's the way that it is. You're not here by accident. You're just not. Because we focus on the bad things about ourselves, we think that he does too. Sorry, some of those like really small emotions I have are starting to come out. 
They're just like little tiny ones. Like mice, kind of, you know. You know, because we, that's the way that we think. Knowing that we're exposed before God, we're like, he sees me as this. He sees me as broken. He sees me as not good enough. He sees me as being incomplete or someone who is willful. But he really says, oh, here's a, here's a guy who knows how to work hard. I'm so proud of you. Here's, here's a really good mom that doesn't like it when she screws up, when she gets mad sometimes. Here's a dedicated husband. Here's a son who wants to please his father. Here's somebody who's meeting the mark. I'm so proud of you. Here's a faithful spouse. Here's a caring soul, someone who cares so much that it affects them when something bad is happening to someone else. Katie and I were talking about that a couple days ago, about um, basically the backside of a gifting. Because, like, one of Katie's giftings is, is being so caring that it backfires on her sometimes. Where it's like, you, you just, you care too much, almost. Where you can't, you can't not care. Whereas, you know, I'm on the other end of the spectrum, we'll just say. And, and I have spiritual giftings too. Like I'm comfortable doing this. I feel relatively at home. I get nervous before, but once I'm up here, I'm fine. That, that ability to speak to people with, with confidence has a backside too because I have to try and daily kill pride all, all the time. That's the thing. That's the number one thing that I struggle with is pride. And I have to kill it every single day because otherwise it will take control of me. There's a backside to every gift, but Jesus focuses on the good. You let him deal with the bad. Don't let it consume you. Does that make sense? Jesus calls out his best quality, even though he knows everything. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Jesus is like the best boss ever. This is just like an aside. Because um, a good boss will praise in public. Like, hey, everybody, Nicole did a great job at Chain Breakers last week. Like, the message was really, I mean, it was a banger. It was awesome, right? He'll, he'll praise in public. Nathaniel, here's a son of Israel, a true son. He's completely integrous. And he'll coach in private. He'll coach you in private. That's why when you feel the Holy Spirit prick your heart while you're driving to work, you shouldn't have said that. I'll never forget the time, and I've told the story probably, did you catch that stutter? A couple months ago, I, I know I set it up here, but Katie and I know someone that was really struggling with their significant other, and they had gone back to um, alcohol and like comp they're just unraveled the life of the family that they were involved in. And I was so mad. I was like, God, how could he do that? How could he do that? I was just, I was like so upset. Because I'm a person. And I focus on what everybody else is doing wrong. And usually I'm like sweeping my stuff under the rug. Um, and he said to me, how do you think I feel when you talk to Katie the wrong way? I mean, just like that fast. It's like, oh, dang it. Busted. Maybe I should get the log out of my eye before I start worrying about anybody else. I mean, that's, that's one example. And, and God will work on those things one at a time. One at a time. Everybody say, Jesus is a good boss. He is a good boss. He's the Lord. He's the biggest boss that you've seen thus far, Travis. Sorry, that was a not super spiritual rap reference. Um, this is my favorite part of this whole thing, and this is what I want to emphasize and focus on with you. I think this is so important. Everybody say, I'm placed here. Yeah, you might be standing here or sitting here, but God placed you here for a reason. 
this is the word. Don't miss it. Don't be on Instagram. Don't be watching TikTok right now. I w- this is the word. How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. How do you know about me? How do you? Like he's like, yeah, I'm, I, I pride myself on being pretty integrous, but how do you know about me? I've never met you before. How do you know about me? Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Raise your hand if you've ever been under a fig tree. I like to get under a fig tree sometimes. I feel pretty sorry for myself. Everybody's fig tree is a little different. And I'm not trying to overly read into the text because it doesn't say. But here's what I know. Jesus says to him, while you were under the fig tree, I could see you. That sea is... Again, it's not like, oh, I see you standing there. It's like, oh, I, oh, I know you. I know you inside and out, forwards, backwards, upside down. I know everything there is to know about you. I know you. I, re- I, I see you. I discern you clearly. I know everything about you. Raise your hand. If you've been under a fig tree this week, and you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to be under the fig tree. It's not fun. Again, we as people think that God's really happy with us and is like more pleased with us when we are meeting the mark. And while it's true, he will, re- I mean, he rewards those who diligently seek him, okay? It's, it's scriptural to be like thinking that God is going to reward you for being diligent, for being faithful, for, for seeking after him. But not in the way that you, what we tend to do is we tend to think that he loves us less when we screw up. And I feel like I repeat myself every time I'm up here, but I'm up here every six weeks, so you guys have had a break. Um, God does not love you more when you're doing better and love you less when you're not, when you're doing worse, when you're missing the mark, when God's told you to do something and you don't do it. He doesn't like, "Mm, my love dropped for you 12% today. It's not like the Dow Jones. It doesn't like have a graph that goes up and down. Oh, we're down 87 points today, 300 points today. He swore on his head. What we tend to do when we're under the fig tree is we think that we're alone. God's not with me. Nothing's going right. I'm not doing this thing right. I'm not good enough. I'm going to sit under this fig tree. And Jesus' answer to that is, I could see you. And you might be doing pretty good. You like just hanging out eating figs under the fig tree. Good for you. That's wonderful. I'm happy for you. And he could have been too. The principle is this. While you were under the fig tree, I knew you. You weren't alone. You were not alone. You are not alone. Everybody say, I'm not alone. How do you know about me? While you were under the fig tree, I, I knew you. I saw you. You're never alone. Even when you're not doing well. 
when you're broken, when you're ashamed, when you're beaten down, when you're addicted, when you're drunk, when you make a bad decision, when you slip up and get back into the signature sin that you can't seem to get off of your back. You're not alone. When you're doing good, when you're chilling under the fig tree, eating figs, you're not alone. God doesn't come and go when you're doing good or doing bad. This is not the direction I intended to go with this. Everybody say, this is my word. He doesn't blow back and forth. He doesn't switch this way, that way. There's not a meter that goes up when you're doing good and goes down when you're doing bad. He's always with you, all the time. You're never alone. You're never in this alone. Jesus saw you under the fig tree when you were broken, ashamed, beaten down, addicted, drunk. He saw you clearly. Everybody say clearly. He saw you clearly for who you are. He sees you clearly for who you are, not for what you've done. That's what we do. That's what I see. I see what you've done. You see what I've done. What's the first thing that two guys say to each other when they have to go to a party that they don't want to go to and their wives are talking? So, Dennis, what do you do for work? What do you do? Tell me about what you do. What do you do? And then you answer the same question, and that's what you base the next too long party on. Everything stems from that. He sees you clearly. And I wish I had a more rah-rah message for you today, but I think this is important because this is your word. He doesn't see you for what you've done. He doesn't see you for what he wants you to do. He's not like, oh, I need you to be, uh, I need you to preach, and if you don't do a good job, then I'm not with you anymore. I need you to be uh, playing the drums, and if you don't do a good job, then you're not spiritual enough. I need you to be donating money to orphanages or I need you to be doing this or I need you to be witnessing or I need you to be meeting the mark or not sinning anymore or give up cigarettes or give up this or give up that or I need you to speak kinder to your spouse or I hope you didn't make it. No, my love is gone. He doesn't abandon you. You're never alone. He doesn't see you for what you've done and he doesn't love you based on what you're going to do. Peter means God has heard. He doesn't base it on what he's heard. He's not like us where we talk about people behind their back and, oh, he did this, oh, he did that. God doesn't like, oh, I heard that you did X, Y, and Z. I don't like you. It's not like that. God sees you for who you are. Cephas. Not Simon. Let's stand. We have all found ourselves here today, not by accident. We're placed here right where we need to be. It's not a mistake that you're here. It's just not. God can change everything about who you are. Everything. He sees you as Peter. Cephas, not Simon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this word and that you see us for who we are in you, not in what other people see us as, not in the things